everyone, today I will be kicking off this video series, Ace Attorney Analyzation. This series has been around for quite some time and there has been enough entries in the franchise to compare everything that we have. Each game will get its own episode and these will consist of the following, evaluating the game's plot, soundtrack, presentation, innovation, cases, flows, dark. Okay, okay, enough. Basically I will be analyzing every aspect of these games. No bias, no unwanted farce or puns, just an honest review. Yes, I will be treating 3A as a series of reviews. These reviews are targeted towards veterans of the series and to those unfamiliar with the series. I know that I never outright said who the audience for these series is, but it's actually for everyone. Let me also note before we properly begin by saying that as the series chugs along, callbacks and comparisons to the previously reviewed games will occur often. This is important to be aware of. Alright, time to review Phoenix Wright Ace Attorney, or as I will be referring to it in this review, PW. It's just shorter and much faster than saying the whole title of the game. PW was released in Japan in the year of 2001, known as Gaiakuten Saiban, on the Game Boy Advance. It did fairly decently for its budget and was eventually ported to the DS in other regions in 2005 for Americans and 2006 for Europeans. Ace Attorney was a game that tried to bring the niche visual novel genre of video games to a larger audience by including appealing graphics and detailed storylines that went above what was considered the norm at the time. Ever since the game's western release, the series has had a cult following and a fan base. Ace Attorney wouldn't be recognized by the general public until Dual Destinies, but that video is far from us from now. Right, Athena? Okay. Well, I played the first Phoenix Wright game back in 2013, and I continued the series up until the latest entry. I would call myself a series veteran, and that I know each of the games like the back of my hand. So let's have a look at the story, case by case. Uh, Spoiler warning, of course. So the game immediately begins with a girl getting smacked to death by a statue. The killer is shown striking down the poor girl and making an effort to blame the crime on someone else. PW opens up really hooking the player with all the drama right off the bat. With the killer's appearance in mind, you start the case. The first turnabout is case one for the series, so let's see how it all begins. You begin seeing through the eyes of Phoenix Wright, a fresh off the bar defense attorney ready for his first trial. Mia Fey, or as Phoenix calls her, Chief, is Wright's mentor. Phoenix whines about how he isn't ready and the poor man isn't confident in himself at all. Mia calms him down and it's clear she exists only for tutorial reasons. Not going to mention her, her uh, physical appearance, uh, just kind of move on from that. The trial begins just like that, the player is not introduced to the case proper, and so curiosity ensues. The judge starts by questioning Phoenix on things in the court record, which both is a great tutorial but also a way to tie Wright's experience with being a lawyer at the time, which is none. The prosecutor, Mr. Payne, is a cocky guy who thinks he can beat anyone in court. He will return as a prosecutor for every first case in each of the games. Well, except a later game. The case is about a woman named Cindy Stone who is murdered in her apartment by Frank Sawit. Larry Butts, elementary school friend of Phoenix, was accused because he came out of his apartment at the same time of the murder. Great, Larry! If you didn't forget to turn the stove off, this would have never happened. Well, Phoenix Wright is an exaggerated, nervous man, but he never comes off as corny. Remember how I just gave a case synopsis? Well, it sounded simple, right? <laughs> well, it is. Very much so. Phoenix was lucky to get such an easy case, to be honest. Prosecutor Payne is one witness, Mr. Sawit, and because the player saw the murderer in the intro, it is obvious that Sawit did it, despite the fact that he is the only witness as well. The first turnabout introduces you to the gameplay and logic behind the game, and it does well thanks to Mia Fey. 
However, the cost is that the game fails to do anything that is interesting at the same time. It does tie nicely into the second case of PW, but the first turnabout is simply lacking in motivational content for the player. The fanbase commonly believes that this case has right to be short and simple, so that the player can get comfortable with the game. I agree, but only to a certain extent. On its own, the first turnabout is fine. However, when we revisit this case in the rest of 3A videos, especially comparing to the other first cases of games, you'll see that there's absolutely no reason to play the first turnabout again. I wish the developers packed just a little bit more in so that it could stand the test of time better. Overall, I don't hold this as a major complaint against the game, but I had to put to rest the claims that this case is one of the best in the series, because that's just silly. Now let's look at the gameplay of PW. By far the best button for the game is the A button, because 90% of the time you will be pressing A to read the next text box. However, you can skip text, though you should never sh ever do that. But it's nice for you when you reread text after presenting the wrong piece of evidence, for example. While I may not use it an awful lot, I appreciate the ability to skip text. It's quite nice. During the investigation segments, you can examine objects in the background to gather evidence, proceed in the plot, or just look for some extra dialogue between the characters. Sometimes it's easy to forget to examine something, but here's a tip from me. If you see something that is obviously important to the plot, examine it last. Get everything else examined in the room, and then examine the big obvious plot thingy. You can also talk to people, present evidence for people, and move location. Pretty simple. The other half of the game is court-based. Other than reading text, you'll be in cross-examinations. This is where the logic system is best. You have to find a contradiction in the witness's testimony. Sometimes the correct answer requires careful reading of the court record, while other times having to infer a bit. While this sounds good on paper, in execution the biggest flaw of the series is revealed. The logic system simply won't click with everyone. You may think something is correct and could shape the plot in a foreseeable way, but the game simply doesn't agree with you. It can lead to trial and error. However, I, like other Ace Attorney critics, do not penalize any games of this. It's unfortunate, but it's nature of the beast. Regardless, I like how the logic system is implemented. So those are the major gameplay shenanigans, and I apologize for telling you things that you already knew, but I need to start somewhere with this series. I stated how I like how the logic and reasoning were implemented into this game so far, but the story is not cutting it at this point. Well, let's jump to case two, Turnabout Sisters. We start out with seeing our chief, Mia Fey, dead. Um, okay. I mean, it's a shame for Phoenix, but it doesn't tuck much at the heartstrings. We saw Mia for a single case. I do like the surprise element of an important character dying near the beginning of the game, don't get me wrong, but it's nothing heart-wrenching. The killer is again revealed as a fabulous man with a pink blazer. Okay, let's back up a bit. Turnabout Sisters actually starts before the crime with a phone call between Mia and the mysterious Maya. Soon after that, Phoenix Wright enters his boss's office with a suspicion that something just died. He walks into the next room and I know we are early into Turnabout Sisters plot, but I have a complaint. Phoenix isn't as shocked or upset as he really should be here. His boss, who he was so close to, is dead right in front of him, and he's still pretty well composed. He sees a girl weeping next to Mia, who is this Maya from the phone call. And I guess leave it to Phoenix to support a lady in need, even when facing your dead boss, but that sounds more like another character's job. Maya Fey is charged for murder thanks to Chess Girl <laughs> April May. Phoenix, being the nice guy he is, takes upon the case, defending Maya. The moments with Phoenix and Maya throughout the case are pretty touching. It's a shame the first encounter will wear off and the relationship will become very normal, but it's well done here. Let's come back to the plot in a bit. Our new characters for the second case are honestly a mixed bag. Just to recap, Frank saw it, had no personality. And that's all for this recap! Those were all the characters from last time. Starting with the good characters, we have Dick Gumshoe, Marvin Grossberg, Maya Fey, and Miles Edgeworth. Turnabout Sisters does introduce these amazing mainstays, but of course I can't give their intro case all the credit for that. Turnabout Sisters seems to be a pretty decent case going by the numbers, but let's get a little more analytical. Going deeper into the investigation, the atmosphere of the case starts to rise. Each location has a warm kind of feel, especially Grossberg's office and the criminal affairs department. Blue Corp is the only exception as it makes you feel 
kind of uncomfortable. Well, that and your encounter with the villain of the case, Red White. <laughs> what a name. Now, the character interactions with Phoenix are basic for the series, but they do their job tone-wise. Everything fits in to make a cohesive case. By far the highlight of the atmosphere, and even the case is actually the not important part of the case, it's just background information. DL6 is foreshadowed, and the history behind Misty Fay and Blue Carp was a real mic drop moment for the game at this point. Capcom reached out to the player during these informative parts and filled the player with curiosity and a little wariness or reluctance. While the foundation for these plot details was in good omen, Turnabout Sisters in the end comes off a bit too large in scope and treats itself to be a lot more important than it really is. Let me explain. Turnabout Sisters throws out many dark moments that come out of nowhere, and the whole Misty Fae scenario, it never felt like you were told at everything that actually happened, you were just told a little bit about it. This will be elaborated a whole two games later, but there was almost no information on who Misty Fae was and what exactly is Red White's deal. My biggest issue with Turnabout Sisters is the poor use of drama. The Ace Attorney series feeds off of dark themes and tense situations, with occasional funny moments to keep the games from having bad pacing. Things like the Blue Corp scenario and the foreshadowing of DL6 is way too overblown, while things like Mia Fey's death and April May schemes are only a slight issue and nothing to dramatize. While I agree with the fans that Blue Corp scenario is a big deal, it was presented so poorly I felt like the game tried to swipe it under the rug, yet at the same time incorporate darker writing. It's not fair to think highly of this event and not some of the other events in future games that have way bigger impacts and were overall more successfully written in my opinion. Overall, if we look back so far at the two cases I reviewed, you can see the biggest fall of AA1. Yeah, I'm confident someone knows by now. Well, it's that there isn't that much to analyze because the game lacks substance and strong writing. But this game is perfect! Yeah, uh, no. While the writing is good and some of the plot points are well thought, the game overall suffers from a basic entry scenario. Ace Attorney Analyzation, the series where I go deep into games and review all aspects present and invisible. It's truly a shame that the first game doesn't really give me the opportunity to fulfill that first objective. However, there is plenty more to cover. Turnabout Samurai is Case 3, and next up. Samurai is a step up from Turnabout Sisters and improves upon the game's pacing, the atmosphere, and the use of drama, thankfully. So one fateful day recording a kid's TV show, an accident occurred on set. The victim, Jack Hammer, who played the villain, was found dead in a costume due to a spear wound. The defendant is Will Powers, the hero of the show who supposedly did the job. Now you might be wondering, how the heck is this relevant to the game, and I guess the real answer is that it's a filler case. However, the excuse is that Maya Fey is a huge fan of the show, and even Edgeworth secretly is. <laughs> I have no issues with an Ace Attorney case being that of a filler one, as long as it can stand alone as a good case. So let's start with the investigation. The atmosphere of Global Studios is really well done. I love how everything is so quiet in the outside areas around the studio, and I love how some of the areas are confined and have that nice cozy feeling, while others are out in the open and give a great view of the landscape. The studio areas themselves are nothing amazing, but the atmosphere outside is very, very good. Now back onto the subject of the plot for Case 3. I believe that the premise and overall atmosphere the developers were going for is superb. Two iconic kid show actors meet an unfortunate fate and the studio is going under financial issues. Unlike last time around, everyone in this case is directly connected to the main problem. Keyword there is directly. Phoenix is informed about the case and meets Will Powers, a character who looks very menacing but is really a gentle kind soul who would not murder a fly. 
Phoenix takes Power's case and has a more thorough investigation to boot. Miles Edgeworth is once again the prosecutor and he has even more tricks up his sleeve. Maya is still in the supporting role, etc. The case sets, for the time, the basis of what a Phoenix Wright case will consist of content-wise. Please contemplate how important that sentence actually is. If you heard my emphasis correctly, you'll realize that Turnabout Samurai would lose its title as the textbook definition for Ace Attorney cases down the line. Very important to note that. We aren't even close to that point, but I just want to get that in mind. Do you know what I find most interesting about Turnabout Samurai? The case focuses less on the plot, and more on the characters and their interactions. You could say that there is a healthy balance, but I see more of a skew. This is welcome to mix things up after Turnabout Sisters, in my opinion. But I thought your opinion wouldn't be in these videos! Um, by fact, this glorified review would have some personal opinion in it, with a huge emphasis on having no bias and fair, even though that still varies between people at times. If you have been put off by the fact that I have incorporated my opinion into this, why? I guess that you thought that I was going to change your minds, or tell you about revelations you've never heard of, or transform the fanbase. Well, while all of those things would be pretty cool, this is still my work, and while I want to be respected for having fair opinions, this is no work of God. Anyways. So about those characters. Will Powers, Jack Hammer, Cody Hackins, Penny Nichols, Wendy Oldbag, Sal Manella, Okay, and D. Vasquez. I find this selection a massive hit. Sal is hilarious with the speech being reflected of a typical teenager's texts, and Wendy... We'll talk about her in a bit. I need a good five minutes for Miss Oldag. Penny is a part of the crew at Global Studios, and a really nice character you can relate to. She's pretty nerdy and has a great attitude towards things. Both Will and Penny are similar, but are different enough to be remembered for different reasons. Will isn't who you expect him to be, and Penny is the only truly helpful asset to the case other than the main cast. Turnabout Samurai also gives us the number one fan of the Steel Samurai, main character of the TV show and the one who played by Will Powers. Cody Hackens is the biggest fan, and he is only but a mere child, yet had to testify and sit up on a box. He turns out to be very important to the case. He also took a picture of someone in the Steel Samurai costume, assumed by the court to be Will Powers. Many fans find this kid unhelpful and annoying, and I agree he is unhelpful because that's the point. I never found him annoying, but if you do, I completely understand why. He yells and can be stubborn, and it, I guess it fits his age. So who's ready for Old Bag? Wendy Old Bag is a, a security guard at Global Studios. This old woman yells at everyone a lot and may just be the most useless character in the series. Now hold on, you might be saying. X character is far less helpful. Y character is far less helpful. Z character is way less helpful. Don't worry, I have you covered down the line. Wendy also happens to be in love with Miles Edgeworth, famously calling him Edgy Poo. The character interaction between Edgeworth and Olbag is a perfect example of Samurai's best moments. In order to really enjoy this case, you have to appreciate these things. I honestly had more fun in the investigation segments here than the court sections, because investigating led to all of the small little things that make Case 3 what it truly is. It's not about deep plots here, and I'm A-OK -okay with that here. Let's close Case 3 with the climax. After Phoenix and Maya discovering that a fence was used to kill Jack Hammer, suspicion grew. Inside the cabin, our protagonists run into D. Vasquez, who is so obviously the villain, but that's okay, not every villain has to be a surprise. Well, except it's not because she has nothing else redeeming about her. She has the quite evil vibe, and that's about it. Or even her breakdown is forgettable and not exciting, but I'm jumping ahead. D. Vasquez, or however you say it, is the one in charge of Global Studios, and this puts, you know, pressure on Phoenix. The atmosphere gets really intense with Edgeworth's ruthlessness asshole methods of winning, and his observed speaking skills pull your not guilty verdict farther and farther away from you. In the end, Phoenix pulled out a miracle. Mrs. Smoker was the only one with the victim at the time of the murder. Phoenix discovered a perfect motive, too. Phoenix Wright, yet again, walked away victorious in a much more fulfilling case this time. PW had three cases so far. 
The first turnabout establishing the game and the series well, but was far from interesting. Turnabout Sisters was a step up and introduced elements that would be series staples, but lacked control over its plot and focused on things haphazardly. Turnabout Samurai is another improvement and is by far the best case PW has at this point. This is where I can safely say the game has hit its standard. Of course, we will have to come back to Case 3 like the rest later and give a revaluation, but for now, it's solid overall. You know what? Let's take an intermission. And now, what was originally the final case of PW in the Japanese release on the GBA, Turnabout Goodbyes. Ladies and gentlemen, we are in for a treat. That's right, Miles Edgeworth is holding a gun next to the dead Robert Hammond. Oh boy, what a way to start! I mean, wow. So, Miles Edgeworth being caught in the same boat as the victim was obviously thrown into detention. Phoenix Wright and Maya Fey hear of this news via television. So, this case starts exactly like Case 3 did, and I've no other- I've no idea why other than laziness. Same old, same old, Phoenix and Mai hear of something on TV like the Loch Ness Monster being caught in a photo and resides at Gordy Lake. Then they decide to go there and it just so happens to be a case that of murder took place. Pulling the same plot card to get yourself off your feet is fine, but right after the case before the present one? Come on, Crapcom. Moving right along, Phoenix meets Edgeworth in the detention center and there's a very awkward yet unsettling atmosphere to the encounter. Miles insists that he goes to prison and he probably wants to die anyways. I'll bring this up now. Edgeworth can seem like an emo at times, but he's really not. For one, he can't be an emo because he's not a teenager. He's just a depressed man with a dark past that will be elaborated upon in the future of this case. Phoenix eventually convinces Edgeworth to be his defense, but he has to do some investigating first. Gordy Lake is one of the best looking areas in the game and is the center of all of the investigation segments. I really enjoyed the marsh-like setting. Gumshoe returns from the last two cases as the lead detective and he grows a little. He doesn't change much, but his personality is giving more time to make its impact. Other than the obvious Phoenix and Maya, none of the cast from the first three cases of PW return. So let's analyze who's new. First up is actually the victim, Robert Hamon. For a dead guy, we learned a good bit about him. Hamon was Yanni Yogi's defense attorney. Keep that in mind for later. Robert Hamon was a very competent de defense attorney but he only took cases for himself and he didn't believe in his clients nearly as much as Phoenix Wright does. Still, he was respected, and he will be missed. The photographer, Lotta Hart, is an exuberant, quick woman with a lot of heart. Lotta is a strange character, but one who never got on my nerves. She needs scoops, and if you leave her alone, then she'll be nice to you. Her interactions with the more calm Phoenix and Mai is hilarious. Next up is Yanni Yogi, who is an old man who sleeps in front of you. This man is insanely scary when you first meet him, for the first time in the boat rental shop on Gordy Lake, with his super sp suspicious demeanor and his creepy expressions. Later on, when you jog his memory on the DL6 case, he becomes defensive and he tries to avoid Wright. Remember the documents on Marvin Grossberg's desk from Turnabout Sisters? Well, more clues found in the boat shop were related to DL6. I also purposefully neglected the acknowledgement of another returning character. Larry Butts shows up <laughs> with a Santa Claus costume and a destroyed blow-up. He's as interesting as he ever was, and I'm very happy to have him back once again. The Loch Ness Monster seen at the lake turned out to just be a silhouetted steel samurai balloon, 
courtesy of the butts. When the balloon popped, it got in the couple picture at just the right time, which is hilarious. More sentimentally, Phoenix reminisces with Larry about their childhood. See, Phoenix, Miles, and Larry were all friends in elementary school. In fourth grade, the class had a mock trial because Phoenix's lunch money was stolen. To people watching this who haven't played this game, I understand this sounds stupid, but once I explain it, you'll realize just how powerful this flashback actually is. Phoenix was crying and Larry wasn't much of help, but Edgeworth defended Mr. Wright with powerful stances and pointing to make his arguments more severe sounding. This event not only made Phoenix want to become a defense attorney, but it directly influenced his iconic style of his actions. This is simply awesome. The classroom in the images has great lighting and the reminiscence theme is just perfect to fit the tone. Now let's head back to the case at hand. Hamond was murdered in the boat far out in the ocean, and if it wasn't Edgeworth's, some serious investigating must be done. Well, spoilers, but any time you defend someone in these games, they are innocent. That doesn't impact the games at all, but it's something to realize. Lotta Hart testifies, but her reliant factor is purely based on her shoddy camera. She's more interested in Gordy anyways. It's just too bad that she knows Gordy was just a balloon. Well, she didn't, but now well. That sure ended her fun. But anyways, tangent aside, Lotta's camera caught two pictures of the crime with the bodies being so hard to make out that it really didn't help much at all. Larry obviously wasn't helpful, and Yanni Yogi turns out to be the culprit. Yanni Yogi wanted revenge for DL6, so he invited Edgeworth and Hamond to his boat shop. Hamond arrived first, and he was fatally shot in the heart, secretly hiding the body on one of the boats. On the fantastic Christmas Eve this already was, Yogi took Edgeworth in the boat into the middle of the lake where he tried to kill the other known party related to DL6, Miles Edgeworth. Yanni jumped out of the boat, swam away while calling the cops. Edgeworth picked up the pistol he discovered next to him with a curious expression before seeing Hamon's body next to him. This whole scenario isn't fantastic for the series, but I would call it the first cool scenario with the crime in the series. Yanni was a genius with this elaborate frame of murder. Pure genius. Phoenix had a hell of a time figuring it out though, because Edgeworth kept insisting on pleading guilty. There were not many useful witnesses except for maybe Gumshoe, and the prosecution is Manfred von Karma. So we completed the analysis of the investigation segments, let's talk about the trials. I would like to start with Manfred von Karma. This man is nothing more than pure jerk. Phoenix was startled meeting Mr. Edgeworth, but in turn out goodbyes, he's even more feared by Manfred. This man has had a perfect record since he began being a prosecutor 40 years ago. If you don't know what that means, no, the record isn't referring to being crimeless, it's a perfect winning record. Granted, Manfred should be proud. However, Phoenix learns that Manfred won many of his trials due to presenting forged or false evidence, or being a bastard to the judge and everyone else. Ruthlessness is his name. I can't really describe just how evil Manfred von Karma truly is but I will say that he is well written for his overused personality, and he is one of the best things to come out of PW, the game. Phoenix and Maya run into Manfred one time outside the courtroom in the evidence room. Manfred realizes that Phoenix withholds evidence from the DL6 case and proceeds to tase him and steal what he wanted. So clearly Phoenix is going to have a hard time in these trials, but he has grown at least a little since the first turnabout. Actually, he has grown quite a lot. For those of you who have been waiting for me to stop neglecting Phoenix Mai and the other main characters, all of that will be addressed in the analyzation segment before the end of this video. So in the trial we have Yanni Yogi, the jerk you may feel bad for, testifies about the murder before his schemes are revealed, but fails miserably at communicating. He keeps falling asleep. Then the unthinkable happens. Yogi's parent, Polly, testifies about DL6. This moment is nothing short of hilarious and goofy. I'm sure someone in the comps is going to say, but parents can't testify and it's not realistic, so therefore it's bad. My reply is, you're in the wrong franchise if you're looking for realism. Actually, that's not wholeheartedly true, but we will cross that bridge in the, another time. Phoenix is asked whether or not Polly's testimony is helpful by the judge, and shockingly, the player is asked the same question. With a small detail revealed, Phoenix bluffed through the entire case. Many challenges such as the lack of reliable witnesses and struggles in looking for clues hindered Phoenix, but he did a great job going all the way through. One last mystery remains. What the heck was DL6? 
Well, we have a dual case segment thingy to examine. Miles is too heartbroken to speak, but we insist to learn. Miles tells us a little story about his childhood. Miles Edgeworth went to his father's trial where Gregory Edgeworth was the defense attorney and Manfred was the prosecution. To finish off the trial, Gregory exposed Manfred for his shady practices, putting a penalty on his perfect record. This made Manfred go literally insane. On the elevator ride after the trial, Miles, Yaniyogi, and Gregory were all locked in. The elevator was stuck and everyone was panicking. Death was near for all three of them as oxygen levels decreased. Tension rose after time and Yanni and Gregory were trying to kill each other. Miles saw his father's gun and tried to disrupt them by throwing the gun. A shot fired at the exact same time through the window of the elevator. Gregory fell to his death. As tragic as this event is, Miles thought that he killed his father due to the timing of it all. This is very sad and tragic, but it adds some depth and weight to the current day events in Turn About Goodbyes. Manfred was proven to be the killer as the bullet fired is still in his shoulder today. Maya and Phoenix rejoice. Maya Zedworth shows gratitude. Maya thanks Phoenix for all the great times and decides to head back to her village and train to be a spirit medium. Another very sad moment that tugs at the heartstrings. And thus, we've completed PW. Uh, actually, that was how the original version ended. We have a fifth case in the proper versions of the game. That's quite a doozy. So the same person died in two completely different places at the same time. Call me enlightened. Two months after Turnabout Goodbye, someone visits the Wright & Co. Law Offices with a request for Phoenix's time. This teenager is Emma Skye, a student studying to become a forensic scientist. You don't see many of those every day. Emma pleaded Phoenix to defend her sister, Lana Skye. Phoenix memorized that Mia and Lana were once acquaintances in the past, and that is pretty much the entire reason he took the job. Maya has already left poor Phoenix, so Emma becomes our new assistant character, and she offers a lot of new things to the table that we'll get into later. Well, actually, I'll just spoil it now. Emma is very good with science, obviously, and she uses a lot of her skills and equipment to help with the investigation. At the detention center, Lana is seen, and Wright is surprised to find out she is the chief prosecutor of the district. When I found this out, I knew there had to be solid evidence for accusing her, and indeed there was. A detective, Bruce Goodman, was murdered in the prosecutor's office parking lot, where he was found in a co-worker's trunk, specifically Miles Edgeworth's car, and the knife has Lana Skye's fingerprints on it. Ouch. Before we pick up the plot, I want to examine the characters. Angel Starr is a traveling packed lunch seller who has a very distinct personality. She's all about her business and is friendly until she gets serious about things. Her flipping of emotions is always catching me and others off guard. She's not the most likable character, but she is original. Then there's the man from the Wild West, Jake Marshall. There's a special aura around Jake. He's super cool with his attitude, and he's just very likable. Jake can be found funny at many times, and even when he's really serious, he's funny. Jake Marshall is also a detective, and he can be helpful to Phoenix and Emma. So you might be asking, where's Detective Gumshoe? Well, he isn't on the case this time, but he did create the Blue Badger, the mascot of the California Police Department, and he does make plenty of appearances. This thing is adorable, and tells us that Gumshoe likes cute things. Oh, Blue Badger. To the trial. Miles Edgeworth is back in action and as ruthless as ever. He's glad to be back after leaving the prosecutor's office. Now, a common complaint from the fan base is that this entire case contradicts Edgeworth's death note of last case. I didn't care to bring it up until now, but I will. 
He'd rise from the ashes, Edgeworth needed to find himself, and so he came back after a temporary break. It does make sense for him to be such a bitch to Phoenix and still likable. Let's just be glad he's here and doing what he loves to do. Angel Star testifies first. This is where Phoenix and Emma panic. I must compliment this testimony. The writers of the game... Never mind. I'll just explain what she told to the court. She claims to have seen Lana, then she arrests her for attacking Detective Goodman. And Lana Sky doesn't comment on this at all. This sucks, because how can you prove that Angel didn't outright arrest her? Well, Phoenix took it in another angle, thankfully. And the genius he is becoming shines here. He points out how Lana mentioned a muffler being in Edward's car, the car at the crime scene. So the judge thankfully postponed the trial to investigate the muffler, and to clear up some loose ends. However, the chief of police, Damon Gant, barges in and reveals the card ID system in place of the Criminal Affairs Department. It was revealed that Bruce Goodman, as he was already seen dead in the parking lot of the prosecutor's office, somehow entered the evidence room. Someone stole that card. This is a genius plot device that could only lead to further shocking factors up ahead. Now, I'll talk about more of the characters in the plot as well as the areas. Along with the characters being involved in the police department, we have Mike Meekins to add to the roster. This is a special officer who is loud and eccentric. Mike is hilarious and he even has his own art style for his detailed sprites. The areas in the case are fantastically atmospheric and pleasant to look at. If you didn't know already, the new character sprites were built for the DS and look amazing, and the backgrounds as well as the new music tracks that play in Rise from the Ashes got buffs as well. Some of my favorites include the prosecutor's office, parking lot, and Damon Gant's office. I want to shed light on the relationship between Lana and Emma Skye. They are close. Close sisters who really like each other. Lana, being her collected and isolationist self, was never how she used to be. Lana used to be happy and upbeat like her sister, but she changed after the SL9 incident. So just like DL6, a tragic case scars the present. This one, maybe even worse. Lana keeps insisting on being the killer of Goodman, and believes that her sister, Emma, killed Neil Marshall, brother of Jake Marshall and victim of SL9. Let's dive into this case, and then we will connect it to the current case. SL9 took place in Damon Gant's office. The serial killer, Joe Dark, was attempting to murder Neil Marshall. Young Emma was up in Gant's office waiting late at night for her sister to take her home from work. Emma saw the madness happen and attempted to stop Joe Dark from killing Neil. However, in the trial, Edward claims that Emma was still the one who killed Neil. Phoenix uncovers that Broken Vase had written on it, Emma, and it was written in blood and wiped away. Ouch. This seems to be the end for Emma and Lana to an extent. However, it was revealed that Damon Gant was at the office during SL9 and created slash forged evidence to blame Emma for the murder. This shocked everyone, including myself. If we connect Rise from the Ashes all together, we have Jake Marshall killing Goodman for being denied access to reopening the SL9 case. We also have Lana Scott, the poor soul caught up in all of this and being manipulated by Damon Gant this entire time. And we have Damon Gant killing Neil Marshall. Now, I know I glossed over many details, but this case is large in scope, and I would say for good reasons. Complex equals good in Ace Attorney, as long as it's comprehensible and logical, to the extent of the game's logic. Every character, side or important, is fleshed out more than the characters of cases 1 through 4 in PW. The atmosphere in Rise from the Ashes is more than just one dimensional, and the plot is stellar. You can tell that I was giving more credit to PW as we went along, but before we go to the analyzation segment of the video and close off the first entry into Ace Attorney franchise, Let's wrap up case 5. Damon Gant is on the stand, and Phoenix pulls off an incredible victory. Damon is a weirdo that is hilarious and creepy. If that wasn't hard to deal with, his status sure is. Phoenix Wright, the once loser who couldn't do anything without Mia Fey, took down the chief of police. I'm quite proud of Mr. Wright for growing this much. With the murder of Goodman and SL9 solved, Emma and Lana rejuvenate in a sad but happy ending. Phoenix says goodbye to Emma before he left, and all ends well. Even though we are seeing the credits for the second time, this time it feels more conclusive. 
and thus we have reviewed Rise from the Ashes. Phoenix Wright Ace Attorney started off the series on nothing less than a good game. PW's goal, as I talked about in the beginning of this video, was to bring a niche market of gaming to a larger audience, and would do so by having outstanding graphics, a good plot, and a smartly designed adventure game trope. PW's presentation is outstanding. For a DS game, the aesthetics look great, plus the music is... it just speaks for itself. Phoenix Wright started out not so good at being a lawyer, but evolved into, with his inner monologue and relatable factor to the player, and this is what makes him a very well-written character. Phoenix Wright has good morals, a man who believes in justice and believes in the court most importantly. Maya Faye is a cheeky girl who always f has fun and is fun to have around, and her spirit channeling powers are really interesting and will of course be expanded upon in the future. Yes, she's coming back. <laughs> Phoenix and Maya are a perfect duo, and that will always prevail. Gumshoe and Miles are other standout main characters that will return in plenty more games, and Edgeworth is so complex that his depression arc even continues into the next game. Well, I can safely say that the good of PW is the characters and getting the series off its feet. I'd also add that it's easy for people to get into and start out with. However, while these issues may not be apparent now, PW stands as my second least favorite in the series. Shocking, right? I overall gave it a good review. But here are the problems with the game. The plot of the earlier cases are too weak for their own good, and the details are too minimal. Also, this case lacks depth. You may say that it doesn't need it, and it can be an easy game to play through and understand, but I object to that because future games had depth and did it well. Even Dual Destinies had depth, and I don't really like that game all that much. Still, despite injecting my opinions into this, it's clear to everyone that this game suffers from first game syndrome. And I don't hold it against Capcom or the game itself, it's just how franchises work sometimes. The games after PW are just better. You may not, you may like PW over many other games, and I understand that. Everyone connects with different cases more than others. But I can't ignore how much of a snooze the first Turnabout, Turnabout Sisters, and Turnabout Samurai can really be at times for me. One major thing I give the first Ace Attorney game credit for, though, is definitely Turnabout Goodbyes and Rise from the Ashes especially. These cases were truly worthy of the Ace Attorney name, and will indeedly stand the test of time. Well, that was Phoenix Wright Ace Attorney. If you were interested in playing this series, make sure you play in order. You may not see my issues with the game until you play the rest, so I think you'll have a jolly time. And to those who have Ace Attorney injected into their blood, I hope you find the answers that you were looking for here. Any detail or overall aspect of the game I missed here was saved for callback sake. That is all for Phoenix Radius Attorney. Court is adjourned. Hello everyone, thank you so much for watching the first episode of Ace Attorney Analyzation. I want to apologize to those who have been waiting patiently for this series to start, and I can happily say that future installments won't take as long, so you guys really deserve this review and all of the following ones too, so. Make sure if you haven't already, please subscribe, like, and comment. Thank you, everyone.